Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the prophet Daniel. Uh, we are continuing in our series in Daniel, looking now at the first part of chapter 2. So we're starting chapter 2, verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream." Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, oh, oh, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show you its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men, wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what was asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. The word of the Lord. Be to Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and that your spirit inspired this word not only to promote the exaltation of your dear beloved son, but also to edify us and our faith that we might follow you and glorify you in our lives. Please enlighten us now. Uh, make your living word alive to us in our hearts and minds that we might be blessed and edified by it. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Where do people today look for direction? Consider the ever-increasing influence of TikTok. Since it went international about six years ago, it has quickly become one of the world's most popular social media platforms with 1.5 billion users. Within our country, there are about 170 million users, a little more than half of the American population. TikTok is especially prevalent among younger adults. 56% of all U.S. adults between the ages of 18 and 34 say they use the platform, and a growing number claim that this is where they get their news. As you're probably aware, on Wednesday, the House passed legislation that would require TikTok to part ways with its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, or face a ban on all U.S. devices. One congr congressman said, what we're after is not a ban, but a forced separation. The director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, has warned that the Chinese government could use the app to control software on millions of devices, among other concerns, one of which is the agenda being pushed on the platform. Now, there are many who use this platform very innocently to promote their businesses, to find recipes, to search for reviews on products, to uh, post their dance moves, or to watch pets do tricks. All very innocent. Others have noticed certain agendas being encouraged, like anti-Israel rhetoric, the trans agenda, the LGBTQ movement in general, on Wednesday, the same day the House voted on the bill, something else made the news. The results from a Gallup poll, which is a reputable organization, were released that found almost 30% of Generation Z women, ages 18 to 26, now identify as LBGTQ+. 30%. That's a shocking number. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the respondents participate in that kind of lifestyle, but that's how they identify themselves. This is way out of proportion from what has been reported in the past. And so we might ask the question, what, what might we attribute this to? No doubt, to a large degree, it's attributed to what is being taught in our schools and colleges and what is being fostered and celebrated on social media. Given the attention and sympathy that uh, people get when they perceive themselves as victims oppressed by society, some have suggested that adopting a trans or bisexual identity may well be a motivation for some young people just very hungry for attention. The Gallup poll published on Wednesday concluded, and this is also disturbing, overall, each younger generation is about twice as likely as the generation that preceded it to identify as LGBTQ+. That is a reality that the church cannot afford to ignore. Apart from the security issues with TikTok in particular, which are real, I am not suggesting that the platform is inherently evil just because some people use it for nefarious purposes. The same could be said of guns, of the internet, of television. Nevertheless, as God's people seeking to engage our culture, being aware of what's happening out there, and desiring to guide our young people in the ways of the Lord, we must be aware that a large segment of our population is spending a significant time on these platforms, not only to obtain and share information, but to look for direction. In this chapter, we find two men facing a crisis, but handling it very differently. 
Nebuchadnezzar is disturbed by a dream, and he turns to astrologers and enchanters. Daniel is faced with execution, and he turns to God. One trusts in human wisdom, the other in divine wisdom. Through faith, the threat on Daniel's life becomes an opportunity for him to testify to the wisdom and power of God over against the idols of his day. And this becomes instructive for us. As you think about where your life intersects with the lives of non-Christians, whether that be at work, school, the gym, your neighborhood, you want to look for opportunities to enter into their lives and to patiently listen to their concerns. Given the human condition, there are many experiences that you will share, and the hope is that they will come to see the difference Christ can make through the gospel. Like this passage, it is often in the context of trials and difficulties that the reality of your faith becomes evident to those around you. And that's one reason that God allows hardships into your lives. We live in a culture that is looking for direction and guidance to deal with life's challenges in all the wrong places. Non-Christians can raise ultimate questions, but they cannot generate ultimate answers. Like Daniel, you and I must pray that God would make himself known and use us to show others the supremacy of his wisdom in Christ over the false ideologies of our day. So in our passage, I, I, I see four different elements here for us to consider. First, Nebuchadnezzar is troubled and trusts in man. And through this, we see the failure of human wisdom. Third, Daniel is troubled and trusts in God, and through this we see the supremacy of God's wisdom. So for our purposes today, we're only going to cover the first two. Nebuchadnezzar is troubled, trusts in man, we see the failure of human wisdom, and then after Holy Week, we'll uh, revisit this passage to deal with the, the next two. First, we see that Nebuchadnezzar is troubled and he trusts in man, starting with verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. In the first chapter of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is presented as a victorious king with uncontested power. Judah, like the other neighboring nations and territories, fell before his army. Like his father, Nebuchadnezzar was a man greatly feared by the peoples of the known world. There was nothing on earth that posed a real threat to his power. From all external appearances, he was a picture of strength and stability, but he had a distressing dream that left him terribly unsettled. This great conqueror, the king of the Babylonian Empire, whose word was never questioned, was suffering from a growing sense of insecurity. The, the dream plaguing his mind was out of his control, which must have been very frustrating for him because he was a man used to being in control. This was not a random dream, by the way. We have those all the time. This was divinely appointed. And as we survey the rest of the book, it seems quite clear that God is intent on humbling the king to demonstrate his sovereignty and supremacy. Back in chapter 1, it says that when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, he took the vessels and articles from the house of God and carried them off and placed them in the treasury of his God. This was a symbolic act, as if to say, my God is greater than your God. My God gave me victory over your God. Nebuchadnezzar failed to realize that it was the Lord who gave him the victory. 
He was only an instrument in God's hand. The Lord would not allow Nebuchadnezzar to boast in his power or attribute his conquest to idols. The Bible tells us that the Lord is zealous for his honor and he will not share his glory with another. So he gave Nebuchadnezzar this troubling dream no human being could explain or describe. God set up the situation to reveal himself as the only true God through Daniel, his prophet. And the Lord continues to work to humble others today. It's hard for successful and powerful people to recognize that there are areas of their lives that they are unable to control because that's perceived as a weakness in a success-driven society obsessed with appearances. But sooner or later, people begin to realize that their accomplishments and their experiences have not provided the answers to the deep-seated questions of life. Who am I? What's my purpose? Why am I working so hard? Does it all matter in the end? And in those quiet moments at night when we're lying on our beds, these thoughts pass through our minds, and for a minute we feel that they must be answered if life is to be meaningful. Those anxious thoughts expose our weakness and undermine our sense of security. And how do people typically respond? It all depends on where they're grounded. Apart from Christ, people fill their lives with diversions. It's just easier to preoccupy and busy oneself with, uh, you know, activity rather than to face one's limitations and mortality. The Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote this. He said, most of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. What did he mean by that? I think what he meant was that our constant desire for distraction and activity leads us down a path of self-indulgence, mischief, and harm to others instead of pursuing God. The inability to sit still in a room implies a deep restlessness, a restless search to uh, find external enticements to fill an internal void, a void that God was meant to fill, but one that the natural heart resists. We rather amuse ourselves with trivialities than to know the triune God. This is true of all of us apart from grace. Even Christians who know and love Jesus can become distant in their walk or grow stale in their joy. Our, our spirits uh, be can become weak, uh, faithfully doing the things that we want to do for the Lord or we believe that the Lord wants us to do without spending time with him. We, we simply refuse to sit quietly and allow the Lord to realign and refresh our hearts in Jesus, who's the one who really satisfies us. I am uh, reminded of the psalm where God says, Be still and know that I am God. It, it is a mercy of God to allow us to come to the end of ourselves. It is something that the Lord teaches us over and over again that we might feel our need for him and know the joy of finding our fullness in his son. How much more for your unbelieving friends and family? Oh, they might feel quite comfortable and content at the moment. It is the grace of God, though, that helps them see that they're not as secure as they imagine. And it doesn't take much, does it? A tragic accident, a severe diagnosis, the loss of a job, the betrayal of a spouse. One day all seems well, the next life is turned on its head. When the supports are kicked out from under you, what do you have to lean on? Without Jesus at the center, life is unstable, 
threatening, unpredictable. Notice how easy it was for the Lord to trouble the troubler of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar had plenty of guards around him, but they could not keep distress away from his spirit. And that ought to be an encouragement for us as we pray for unbelieving family and friends. God is able to get their attention. I remember uh, when I was in college, we would share the gospel in the dorms. And so I was in uh, one of my friend's dorm room and his roommate came in and we shared the gospel with him. And he said, you know, I, I don't think I need that. I think evolution provides the answers. I don't see any need for God. Of course, we prayed for him. A week later, I was in the same room with my friend. His roommate comes in and not charging at me, but really quite desperately approaching me. And he says, tell me how to become a Christian. It's like, whoa, what happened there? Something put the fear of God in him. I don't know what it was, but I was surprised. Uh, but it was a delightful surprise. I didn't know what would happen to that guy. I thought he was very close. Look how the Lord changed his heart, changed his attitude. It's amazing. Don't lose hope of what people can do in the lives that you're trying to reach with the gospel. Whether it be world leaders, celebrities, business tycoons, we simply don't know the uneasiness they feel despite the pomp and pleasure they enjoy. We catch a glimpse of their lifestyle through the media and we're tempted to envy them. But if we could look into their hearts, we might pity them. Now, how about this dream? Have you ever had a bad dream? I have. Oh, what a relief to wake up and realize that it wasn't real. I, I have some very vivid dreams. Some of them could be made into science fiction movies, and if I could just remember. Well, the dream Nebuchadnezzar had made a deep impression on him, and he sensed that it had significance for his position and for his kingdom. And when he doesn't get the answer he wants, he grows very angry, agitated, irrational. This behavior is quite common among dictators and politicians who fear losing control. Children, I wonder if you have ever dealt with a bully in your neighborhood or at school. Bullies think they're tough because they can push other people around. But kids, I want you to remember this. This is something my father told me. He said, the reason that they're doing that is because they're insecure. So you should feel sorry for them. They're, they're terribly insecure. They boss people around so that they, they will feel like they're superior, like they're in control. But it's a false confidence. And trouble will ultimately turn back on them when someone stands up to them and punches them in the nose. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending that you should do that. You can talk to your parents uh, about that matter. I will tell you this. I'll tell you a secret, uh, children and youth. When I was in the third grade, we, we moved from Pennsylvania to New Jersey. And so it was mid-year, and I was the new guy. Oh, I got picked on immediately. Everybody had their circle of friends. Everybody was settled. And there were kids out to beat me up just because I was new. Finally, that passed. By the fifth or sixth grade, I had adopted that attitude. There was a guy named Eddie. I still remember his name. Eddie came mid-year, and I thought I was a tough guy, and so I would bump into him. I said, who do you think you are? And you want to fight? And I kept on saying it, saying it, and then one day, I must have been insane. I said to Eddie, during recess, I'll meet you by the tree and we'll, we'll see who's really tough. So we get out there and, you know, the, the boys are there. It's far from the doors. I'm like, okay, Eddie, come on, come on. And then, bam! And I was in a daze. <laughs> Who am I? Where am I? What happened? And that was it. I said, 
Eddie, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, please forgive me. I learned my lesson uh, on, on that. Don't do that. You don't have to have wealth and power to compensate for your insecurities in unhealthy and godly ways. Many men and women deal with their insecurities through overachievement or overindulgence, but the idols they construct are not able to provide lasting satisfaction for their souls. Only Jesus can do that. As Christians, we want to show the world a better way. We have insecurities ourselves as believers, but we ultimately find our sufficiency and stability in God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. If you want to have an authentic testimony in this culture, God is going to allow you to undergo trials like Daniel to stretch your faith and uncover your weakness. And these trials then become opportunities to communicate your faith, to give you a platform to speak into the lives of others. I can assure you, your co workers and friends are not as interested in how you handle success as they are in how you handle your problems and trials. So don't be afraid to let people see you struggle. When a crisis hits and your friends ask you how you're doing, don't offer the typical answer, I'm fine. Instead, why not tell them that you're facing some tough challenges, but your relationship with Jesus is sustaining you? And then you ask them, well, who do you turn to during tough times? As we share the gospel, we pray that our friends will turn to God and recognize the failure of the world's wisdom. That's the second thing I want us to see. When we began this series, I mentioned how prevalent the occult was in Babylon. Notice the kind of men who were appointed to advise the king in verse 2. Magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. Some of your translations say astrologers. The Chaldeans and astrologers are basically synonymous. The king calls for them. And no doubt they were proud of being sent for the king to show off their wisdom and insight. One cannot help but be amused by this exchange between Nebuchadnezzar and his advisors, beginning in verse 4. Look with me there. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, this word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be laid in ruins. You think you have a tough boss. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show you its interpretation. And the king said, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time because you see the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. Now, some are of, are of the opinion that Nebuchadnezzar forgot his dream and wanted his advisors to tell him. I hold to a different position. When the king says he wanted to know the dream, I take it as he wanted to know the meaning or significance of the dream. Some of us recall our dreams, especially right after we have awakened. If the king had forgotten the dream altogether, how would he be able to verify if his advisors came up with an answer? How would he know if it's true or not true? The king requested an answer from his wise men, and they had nothing to say. And their silence speaks volumes about the spiritual barrenness of the gods that they represented. 
If they lacked the ability to discern his dream, how could he trust anything they had to say? What divine insight did they really have? Today, there are many false voices who make grandiose promises that turn out to be empty because they're based on human wisdom and not God's wisdom. Often the world's wisdom takes on a spiritual form because Satan would like to persuade us that these notions come from God when they do not. So we think of all the false religions in the world, the New Age movement, all the cults that continue to exist. There might be a veneer of truth on the outside. It takes a lot of truth to float a lie, as one of my professors said. But underneath it, it's just a lie. It's just a lie. Underneath the veneer of truth, it's a lie. It's the old thing of follow rules and rituals. And if you perform well enough, God will accept you and bless you. This leaves no room for Jesus, which is exactly what the devil wants. He fell because of pride, and he appeals to our own pride to depend upon ourselves to secure our eternal destiny and happiness. Satan's never had a lack for ideas. When one idea is floated around, and people get used to it and then turn away, uh, it's eclipsed by another exciting but empty claim. At times, people do come to realization that their lives are not being dramatically changed by following a certain path, and so they move on to the next fad, but that too will fail them. The world's wisdom will always come up short because our root problem is our sin and separation from God. And if you are not rightly related to God, nothing will ultimately be right and you'll be wandering off in the wrong direction all the time. It is through the gospel that we come to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. True wisdom is found in him. Paul says in Colossians, it is in Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then he goes on to say, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends upon human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. I find it interesting that the same deceptive philosophies that proved useless, worthless to the king of Babylon are still adhered to today. The ongoing fascination with astrology and horoscopes reflects people's desire for wisdom beyond their own minds. They want direction for their future. Astrology, as you may know, is the ancient belief that a person's destiny can be found in the pattern of the stars and the planets at the time of one's birth. It is a belief, however far-fetched, that inanimate objects, like planets made out of rocks and stars made out of gas, have some all-encompassing influence over your life. Now, don't confuse astronomy with astrology. One is science, the other is science fiction. Or as one said, the difference between astronomy and astrology is about 50 IQ points. Something to that effect. Did you know that every day, tens of millions of your fellow Americans consult their horoscope for guidance, for direction? A Gallup poll found that 25% of Americans believe in astrology, and another poll found that 10% of self-professed evangelicals believe in astrology, which is completely outrageous. Not only is it forbidden, it is foolish. In his book, The City of God, book five of that work, 
St. Augustine offers a brief but valuable critique of astrology, one worth noting given how popular it is in our culture. First, he says, if astrology is true, it leaves no room for God. If people are necessarily determined by the stars, what kind of rule over men's actions is left for God? Second, the bankruptcy of astrology is plain when we remember how many people differing in kind, character, and capacity can be conceived and born at any one time and place under the same conditions of the stars and planets. I am sure that somewhere in Austria, a baby was born the same time Adolf Hitler was born. Why did he turn out to be such a monster when others born at the same time had a totally different life? Furthermore, Augustine says, if our destiny is determined by the stars, then we can't really hold anyone morally responsible for their actions. And lastly, what are we to make of twins? born with practically no interval of time between their births and could see precisely in the same moment. Why don't they share the exact same destiny? And astrologers have never been able to explain why twins are so different in what they do and achieve in their occupation and skills and in other aspects of their lives and deaths. Most people who consult the horoscope have not weighed the claims behind it. They believe it because the predictions are so general and ambiguous they can apply to anyone. Not only is astrology contrary to common sense, it is opposed by God. It is offensive to him because it attributes to planets and stars the power that belongs to him alone. And it offers direction by other means that God has appointed and turns out to be useless. In Isaiah 47, the Lord mocks the astrologers, his rebellious people were trusting in. This is what he says. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. They can't even save themselves. Each of them goes on in his error. There is not one that can save you. Whether it be astrology or some other false philosophy or ideology, they are all unreliable guides. Praise the Lord that he has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves that we have been saved from the deception of worldly wisdom. As you engage others where God has placed you, listening to them, discovering what they believe in, what they hope in, what they rely in, you have good news to share with them. And this is where the book of Daniel points forward to Jesus. Notice how the king's advisors responded to him in verses 10 and 11. Look with me there. The Chaldeans, or astrologers, answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well... What they thought impossible, the one true living God made a reality. In the person of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, came to live among humanity, thereby disproving the false theology of the Babylonians. What does John say? The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came and he lived a life of perfect wisdom, perfect combination of obedience to God's word and constant dependence on the Spirit's guidance. He accomplished for sinners what sinners are unable to do and his great love for his people, for you and me. And the good news of the gospel is that someone has come to save. 
Someone has come to bear our sins and to freely give us the righteousness we need to stand before a holy God. And so by grace, we respond in repentance and abandon our love affair with the gods of this world and the wisdom and power they offer, and we bow down to Jesus. In faith, we throw ourselves on God's mercy and trust in the death of Jesus to cover our sins. That is the only way to receive the life he offers. It is true that social media has captured the attention, the daily attention of billions of people And it may seem like these platforms and the progressive agendas that are often promoted there have won the day. But when people face the harsh realities of life, when their thoughts and experiences cause your unbelieving friends to be shaken, troubled, and distressed, it will not be enough. Nothing the world offers will be enough but hopefully you'll be there among them, like Daniel. Not to offer your opinions or your suggestions, but to convey the hope and wisdom God has revealed in his word and in his son, which endures forever. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we daily need the teaching of your spirit that with true humility we might depend upon your word and seek you in prayer, lest we take too much upon ourselves. Our lives are in your hands, and we ask that you would keep us in such a way that the ungodly may know that we do not glory in ourselves, but that we glory in you. And as you freely give yourself to us, may we all the more apply ourselves to worship you fervently and devote ourselves entirely to you, leaving no remnant of praise for ourselves, but only that glory that your your son deserves, that his glory may shine in all the world. Amen.